was one of the greatest rescues of modern history. Driven by the power of television, sustained by the power of rock and roll, and one man's outrage. But the Ethiopian famine of 1984 was also one of the greatest tragedies of the 20th century. A scourge of biblical proportions overtook one of the most ancient Christian civilizations on earth and swept everything before it. Drought is everywhere. Here on the high roof of Africa, they call their bitterly unpredictable rains God's tears. But for the third season in a row, no tears have fallen. In the mountains of Ethiopia, death is everywhere. But the highlands are not only parched by drought, they're running with blood. Backed by the Soviet Union, Ethiopia's Marxist dictator, Mengistu, is waging a brutal civil war. Fleeing their blighted farms and the fighting, thousands are forced to take to the roads in a desperate search for food and safety. For many, their only hope is a small town on Ethiopia's main spinal road. Koram is perched high on a plateau. The only way to reach it, a punishing zigzag trail up the face of the escarpment the end of what becomes known as the Famine Road. At the top is a small feeding camp. By the summer of 1984, it is literally overrun. Well, I'm uh, just wondering whether we should put this child uh, probably into the, the more intensive supervision area over there. At the center of this growing disaster is Canadian Judith Appleton from Britain's Save the Children Fund, one of just two Western aid agencies in Coram. On the plain north of Coram, it was a sea of tents, disheveled people, sick people. It was horrible. It was horrible knowing that there were going to be deaths in the morning, that were nothing, there was nothing we could do about it. It was horrible working with those very, very thin children who were lifeless, listless, their mothers equally so. Appleton is overwhelmed and becoming desperate. Despite the extent of the disaster, no food is coming through. Ethiopia's grain stores are empty. actually talking seriously about the possibility of perhaps having to shut down feeding operations if, uh, if there was nothing else coming up the road. So it really was quite desperate at the beginning of 84. While Ethiopians reap the bitter harvest of drought, in the West, farmers bring in one of the most bountiful crops in history. Worldwide, 260 million tons goes into storage, grain mountains that no one can eat. But none of it goes to Ethiopia. They're on the wrong side of the Cold War, a Marxist regime that the West is loath to help. 
the reputation of the then Ethiopian government was akin to maybe North Korea these days. It is, it is a totalitarian regime and it's one where the British and American governments are damned if they are going to do anything other than the most minimal humanitarian assistance. But the most minimal humanitarian assistance in this case meant leaving millions and millions of innocent Ethiopians <laughs> deprived of the food aid which these countries had in abundance. Ironically, the United Nations is to blame. While thousands scrounge for food in Coram, a special UN mission tours the country. They don't go to the worst hit areas, but still conclude that Ethiopia has enough food to feed itself. That report has a devastating impact. Soon after it's published, the Ethiopians invite the who's who of the aid world to a meeting. They're about to beg for help. That meeting went disastrously wrong. Nothing happened as a consequence of eloquent, well-grounded appeals from the Ethiopian authorities to come up with grain, enough grain, enough international food shipments to keep uh, Ethiopian Highlanders alive. Relying on the disastrously wrong UN report, Western donors offer just 125,000 tonnes of food aid, one-seventh of what Ethiopians so desperately need. Hundreds of kilometers to the north, British filmmaker Charles Stewart is making a documentary about drought, completely unaware of the unfolding crisis. Unwittingly, Stewart is about to become the first Western journalist to find out about the Great Famine of Ethiopia. It was a clinic. It was the only clinic for 100 miles all around. And we were filming there one day, the first day we'd ever filmed in it. There were queues and queues always outside. People waited and waited and waited. And this mother came in with this child and they'd walked from Coram. And Coram was a four day walk away. How the child is today? And they were very ill, sick. And they told us that there was starvation in Coram. By the time Stuart arrives in Coram, 10,000 people fill the camp. For the next two weeks, Stuart films with a gathering sense of horror. Every day, food is expected. Every day, it fails to arrive. Judith Appleton is trying to feed 2,000 children a day, but emergency food supplies are almost gone. From what Stewart can see through the lens of his camera, it's clear that Ethiopia is on the brink of a humanitarian disaster. starting to die. When 
Stewart's documentary is shown in Britain, it raises $24 million for Africa. But it has no lasting impact. Aid agencies still believe the faulty UN report. None of the NGOs, none of the charities, accepted there was an ab abnormal problem. In fact, the Disasters Emergency Committee, after we made the film, said, uh, would not put an appeal out for Ethiopia. They said, Ethiopia's got enough food. But what seals the fate of the Ethiopian people is its own government. Mengistu is about to celebrate the 10th anniversary of his brutal rise to power. To avoid any distractions, he bans all travel north of the capital. No one, not even aid agencies, are allowed into the famine areas. But the ban is about to be broken. And the famine, raging for more than two years by now, is about to be revealed to the world. Just after daybreak, aid worker Will Rue pilots his small twin otter over the highlands of Ethiopia. It's the first time he's been north of the capital in months. On board is BBC correspondent Michael Burke and cameraman Mohamed Amin. A lot of the population of those northern provinces of Tigray and, uh, and, and Wallow uh, are just upped and left their villages and headed for the main spinal road that runs up through Ethiopia, desperate to get to somewhere where they thought, well, at least some help might have got there, some food might have got there, and the road was their big hope. So picture the idea of millions of people, actually, just suddenly realizing one day, if we stay here, we're going to die, we might as well die on the road, and all migrating towards various points on this road where they think, because of the fighting, yes, well, that's where the, the government might be able to get some, some food. So everybody, everybody on the move. Burke's assignment is to find out what's happened to the money raised by the Charles Stewart documentary. Almost immediately, there's a problem. The destination that we had planned to take the BBC to that day, Lalabella, to the south, had been overrun overnight by the uh, Tigrayan People's uh, Liberation Army and obviously was no longer uh, accessible to us. And now we had to think about a change of plans. For Burke and Amin, there's no question. They decide to violate Mengistu's ban and risk entering the famine zone. Since Charles Stewart was here, the main rains have failed once again. When Burke arrives at the feeding camp, he discovers the crisis has become a catastrophe. You can hear the groaning and, you know, you can see this sort of grey, it's like the sea, if you know what I mean. There's a sort of greyness, but a sense of movement. Uh, amongst these thousands and thousands of people in this field, and groaning and the coughing and occasionally and some screaming and, and, and wailing. Burke soon discovers the death toll is also out of control. When Stuart was here, 35 people were dying a day. Now, it's 100. Burke and Amin have just one day to capture this Holocaust. It's too dangerous for their airplane to wait longer. The aid center is enclosed by a low wall, and Burke can see that it's surrounded by thousands of desperately starving people. As he talks to aid workers, they tell him there's so little food, they're being forced to make an impossible choice, who to let in and who to keep out. Inside the wall, the chosen wail their thanks. The few tins of butter oil they receive are the gift of life. All those outside can do is watch. The idea that this 
um, this uh, ancient visitation should actually happen in in a late 20th century world struck me as one of the things that I wanted to bring home the extraordinary way that this thing from man's prehistory was still there and claiming thousands of lives. Michael Burke is driven to anger, horrified that the world's unwillingness to help could have such brutal consequences. The thing that boiled inside me, I suppose, was wanting to be able to say at the end of the day about my people that they cannot say they didn't know. And I just wanted it to get as wide a currency and as big an impact as possible. Dawn, and as the sun breaks through the piercing chill of night on the plain outside Corum, it lights up a biblical famine now in the 20th century. This place, say workers here, is the closest thing to hell on earth. On October 23, 1984, Michael Burke's first story goes to air in Britain. Paddy Coulter is with Oxfam and witnesses the reaction. When the Michael Burke footage hit B uh, BBC television, it was really like being in a hurricane. Thousand children here now. It was phenomenal. It was dramatic. Suddenly, the British people started literally almost throwing things at Oxfam. It was day and night, uh, sacks of money, phone calls of assistance. Uh, I remember one family selling almost the entire contents of their house. They were so moved by what they'd seen. Money floods in. Across the country, Britons donate $245,000 a day, shamed by their own government's failure to act. Another person watching Burke's report that night is rock star Bob Geldof. Propelled by anger, Geldof is about to change everything. It was a devastating report. It was withering and merciless in what it was showing you. I remember being very angry, is what I remember, and ashamed. By the next morning, after a sleepless night, an exhausted Bob Geldof has decided to act. He's going to make a record to raise money and draw attention to the plight of the Ethiopians. Now he needs some help. I just walked up the road from where I lived to the cafe where I go. And I passed Antiquarius, which is a little antiques arcade there. And I looked in the window, and uh, there was um, Gary Kemp from Spandau Ballet, who was uh, looking in this shop. I said, did you see that thing? And he said, yeah, I did. I said, you know, I I'm going to do this thing with Midge. And he said, fine, we're there. But to make his scheme work, Geldof knows he needs the biggest names in the world of pop music. I went to the Picasso Cafe just literally outside here and, you know, I had a coffee and I thought, no, I'll, I'll go for it. I'll give Sting a ring, but he's probably not here. Sting, yeah, hi, Geldof, what's up, you know? And I said, did you see that thing? He said, he said I can't believe it because Sting's very politically attuned. And, you know, we're, we are very good friends and... I'm doing this thing, he said, I'm in. So by the end of the first day, and that's why I talked about the resonance of this report, I thought it was just me. This affected everyone. It's early Sunday morning. It's been just two weeks since the Burke report, but Bob Geldof has managed to bring together a group of pop musicians that will soon be known around the world as Band-Aid. This morning at a small studio in West London, they'll gather to record, do they know it's Christmas? But not everyone shows up. Boy George was in America, 
and you know I'd got he said oh, I don't know and anyway so he wasn't there so I was furious so I got the hotel number I said where are you and he said oh, I'm in bed and I said get up you know and he said why why and I said where are you he said New York and I said there's a concord at one o'clock get up and get to the airport you know you'll get here by six he goes no it's, I said it's there and I went Bono, Sting, Le Bon, you know can you Really? He said, yeah, okay, well, I, I'll, I'll come then, you know, and bingo, there he was at six o'clock that night. In a matter of weeks, Do They Know It's Christmas becomes the biggest selling pop record of all time, grossing a massive $20 million. Here on WWFM is Band A. There were queues all down Oxford Street of people queuing to buy this record. And I'd done the deal with the record companies and not a single penny would be taken off, and not a single cent. Every, every single person was working for free, down to the factory workers who gave up their weekends to come in, and the pressing plants were opened all over Europe just to press this single record. This little piece of plastic was the club card membership into Outrage. It worked as... Um, as something that allowed you to say, no, no, I'm not part of this, I'm not complicit in this biblical murder. Geldof's bold act of conscience inspires rock musicians around the world. In the United States, they record, we are the world. In Canada, the biggest names in the music industry come out to help. In a day they produce, tears are not enough. Around the world, 25 charity records are made. Worldwide, more than $100 million is raised. But turning it into food aid and getting it to Ethiopia will take months. And even when it does get there, Cold War politics will once again block its way. The Ethiopian famine has been raging for more than two years by now. But in Addis Ababa, starvation has been banished. As word of the public outcry in the West reaches Ethiopia, the Mengistu government closes the border and slams a news blackout on the deepening crisis. But once again, Mengistu's attempt to block the story is failing. A television crew is already in the country, a crew from the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. CBC correspondent Brian Stewart is on his way to Coram. He's about to play a critical role by keeping the story alive against the odds. Like Michael Burke before him, Brian Stewart can't believe what he's witnessing. My first image was, my God, it's just like an Auschwitz or something. It's like a concentration camp. You felt all the back in time at another period of hell, historically. By now, eight million are afflicted by drought. Although hundreds of thousands of dollars have been raised, None of it has arrived in Ethiopia yet. There was a level of pathos in Ethiopia that was just stunning, uh, mind-stopping. It was the tragedy of a people who'd done absolutely nothing wrong, upon whom it descended the worst fate imaginable, to see their own family members die in front of them, one after the other. next three weeks, Stewart and his team are the only journalists in the country, the only ones who can keep news of the disaster flowing to the world. We felt that um, we were a witness to a unique event, not only in the history of Ethiopia, but I think in the history of the world in that century, and that our job was to bring it to people's attention as quickly as we could. On all of us, uh, there was this tremendous sense of, my God, I hope uh, my career has prepared me for this and we, uh, we had better do a good job because uh, um, 
somebody's got to alert the outside world and, and very, very rapidly. Uh, otherwise, we're going to lose them by the hundreds of thousands here. Every morning, the dead are brought out of the feeding camp and prepared for burial on the edge of the plain. By now, the horror of what the CBC team is filming is taking its toll. Worst hit is editor Colin Dean, who's holed up in a room at the Hilton Hotel in Addis Ababa. It was just getting beyond the level at which we could um, absorb um, what was happening. All I saw was, I saw it on a monitor, I th uh, but you see it over and over and over. It did, it, it's the most oddly terrifying thing you can, you can imagine, really. That's, uh, yeah. One night, overwhelmed, Dean begins cutting a music video that will have a profound effect on the Ethiopian famine. I just started putting pictures to, to music as it occurred to me from my notes and my memory of what I'd been editing and what have you. I remember collapsing in the bed in the uh, Hilton Hotel, in the, in the hotel one evening, and uh, just wanting to sleep. And I kept hearing these edit sounds going on all night. Squeak, 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 squeak. And I can remember getting to the end of the item and stopping the machine. And I, I can, I can remember just sitting in tears. video is never aired on the CBC, but in just a few months it will play a stunning role in the unfolding drama of Ethiopia. But getting the news story out is a problem. Mengistu's ban is still in place. Tony Berman, Stewart's producer, comes up with a daring plan. And what I had done is I had uh, basically taped the video cassettes to my back, and I wore a kind of a, a sweatshirt, like a poncho, so I looked quite hefty. But in reality, um, the reason was that I had about four or five cassettes just literally taped um, up and down my back. But I had to kind of get it through the airport sensors. You know, I remember saying to him, you know, uh, if you're caught, this is not a gentle regime. Uh, and we, he said, we have no enough time, we've got to get this out, we've got to feed from Nairobi, we're going. I was in the lineup. I identified myself as a tourist. I didn't identify myself as a journalist. The airport security control had broken down, which was uh, a marvelous stroke of luck on my part. And, and that's basically what happened as we landed, I think it was an hour or so later in Nairobi, and I just immediately went to the feed point and we just fed, fed the pieces to London. For weeks, Stuart, Berman and their team keep filming. They travel all over the highlands, attempting to convey not only the scope of the disaster, but the immense personal tragedy engulfing the people of Ethiopia. One day they arrive in Mekele and head straight for a small clinic run by Irish nuns. It's here that Stuart meets a little girl named Burhan. We arrived and uh, started filming along this wall, this, again, brown, khaki-colored wall, figure after figure of a mother with a child, another child brought in, and at one stage out of the corner of my eye, I saw the small child just collapse. is dying and nothing will save this child now she will die you know there isn't anything we can do at this point for the child maybe within 15 minutes 
So we looked at each other and I said, look, let's, I can't, I don't want to stay for this. Let her die. At least give her the dignity of dying in peace. Let's get the camera out of here. And we left. But by that afternoon, driven by his responsibility to tell Burhan's entire story, Stewart reluctantly returns to the AIDS center, expecting to film a funeral. And I remember, always remember driving into the uh, site of this crowded ground around the clinic and uh, jumping out and saying that one of the sisters has, uh, has she been buried yet? She said, who? And I said, the little girl, she said, oh no, she's not buried, she came back, she's fine. I said, what? Hopefully she will survive. It was the first unbelievable happy survival story we had seen that seemed to symbolize everything. How desperate things got, how just a little bit more effort might turn it around, and then life apparently after death. Stewart and Burke's reports, and stoked by Bob Geldof's record, public outrage reaches a fever pitch. Governments around the world finally respond, and an international airlift swings into high gear. For Oxfam's Paddy Coulter, it's like manna from heaven. If you were like me, you saw the world's airlines descending American C-140s, British Hercules, uh, Russian Antonovs. The world is suddenly throwing food aid at Ethiopia. But planes can only deliver a small fraction of what Ethiopians so desperately need. And shiploads of Western grain will take months to reach the country. Although the world has finally responded, many fear it may already be too late. On January 6th, Christmas Day on the Ethiopian calendar, Bob Geldof arrives in the country. First shipments of grain are finally being unloaded, but Geldof knows more is desperately needed, and he's come to spend the $20 million raised by Band-Aid. It's been a month since Brian Stewart was here, but the famine is worse. As he heads north, Geldof is apprehensive about what he'll find in the feeding camps. I saw unimaginable horror. I saw things that no human should ever have to see. I noticed small children because their parents had fallen by the wayside on the long journeys into the camps. And some of these little boys and girls were five and six and they carried their baby brothers on, and sisters on their backs. overwhelmed by the size of the catastrophe and as he hands out his money to aid groups realizes it's a pittance enough to feed the starving for just two weeks enraged by the world's slow response he decides that he must do more I saw the malignant hand of man laid bare in all its cancerous pitiless filth that's what I saw and um, and I thought that a little record wasn't good enough. Driven by a desperate sense of urgency, Geldof returns to London. 
He persuaded people to buy his record. Now he needs something more dramatic to convince them to help save a nation. Geldof decides to create on a grand scale a mega event that will not only unite the world, but raise millions for Ethiopia. He calls it Live Aid, the biggest television and concert event the world has ever seen. the global jukebox 52 of the world's top rock acts in 12 countries connected by a web of 14 satellites but despite the excitement on stage in pledge rooms around the world things are going horribly wrong the phones aren't ringing David Hyten the man in charge is in a cold sweat because we'd worked with Bob Geldof we knew what the concert was about Yes, it was a nice day out for people, and yes, enjoy the music. But actually, what it was about was raising money, and it wasn't. There are people dying now, so let's give me the money. And here's the numbers. We let's need go through the way. No, we're probably going to get the address just, first, aren't we? No, let's fuck the address. Let's get the numbers. <laughs> but Geldof's plea goes unanswered. Have have the first. At almost the, the same moment, David Bowie finishes his set one song early. He's about to introduce a video the one created by Colin Dean in Addis Ababa. When Bowie saw it for the first time a week ago, he knew it had to be part of the concert. Lest we forget while we're here, I'd like to introduce a video made by CBC Television. with people whatever you've been looking at this is what it's about and it was just the sole moment in the day by the way and at that point international phone lines just collapsed just went down you know and just this flood of money just came in we got to the point where it's half a million pounds every hour and that just kept going and going and going right throughout the rest of the concert I mean there were people in Scotland sold their houses I got a phone call in the production suite from Ireland, the Irish producer saying, Bob, there's old ladies outside the door wanting to give me their wedding rings. And I said, take them. For weeks afterward, money pours in. $370 million for famine relief. Bob Geldof has once again galvanized the world. But this time, will it make a difference? Will it save the people of Ethiopia? For the first time, there's hope in Ethiopia. Hundreds of thousands of tons of food is flooding into the country from all over the world. Four hours a day, by every means possible, hundreds of willing hands move mountains of grain. Hundreds more pack it into trucks for the long and difficult journey from the coast into the mountains. One of 
the biggest food convoys ever assembled weaves through the desert on its way to the feeding camps on the high plateau. Live Aid alone buys 70 trucks able to haul thousands of tons of food. People in the feeding camps, it's a godsend. After two years of the worst famine in modern history, people are finally eating. For Bob Geldof, it's hope made real. He's there to witness, for all those who cared enough to give, the power of their gift. Live Aid was the, was the political lobby, and that's what it was. Live Aid was to take the emergency aid of, of Band Aid and USA for Africa, and that the emergency which addressed the issue and take it into the political sphere. This is a political issue, and um, it must be addressed that way. Geldof's ability to speak out, I think, meant that he got an audience, a constituency for aid, which went way beyond the established supporters of Oxfam or Save the Children Fund. Uh, and I think he pulled in a generation which might have been otherwise very cynical. The fact that he got musicians uh, uh, a constituency which you know, hadn't been characterized by tremendous interest in um, the developing countries. And he, he got these people to stand up and be counted. I think was, it really transformed the whole thing and made, made the, the uh, scale of popular support for intervention in famines, I think something which no government now can, could ignore. <laughs> It's estimated that more than one million Ethiopians died in the famine of 1984. Yet the disaster also marked a new beginning for Ethiopia. In 1991, Mengistu was overthrown, a victim of his own brutality. Since then, famine has truly been banished. And in the last year, 2002, 2003, 75 million people were successfully fed by the United Nations and World Relief and because of many of the lessons they had learned in Ethiopia. And the world, thank God, hasn't let an Ethiopia reoccur. It's come close, but it hasn't let it. And that's one of the, the still lingering influences of Ethiopia, that we haven't let it happen again. Yet the country still suffers. While we've helped Ethiopians avoid the scourge of famine, we've failed to help them escape a life of crude subsistence. Ethiopia gets the most relief aid, in emergency aid, of any country in the world. And yet of all the poor countries, Ethiopia gets the least development aid. So we're, we seem to be unwilling to see them die, but we don't seem to be particularly keen, or at least we're not putting the money up, to, to actually promote development programs that might make them less dependent. These people are still hungry. That is ridiculous. These people are burdened with debt. They can't pay, should not pay, will never be able to pay. So how can they develop health structures or educational structures? If they don't develop them, how can they have good governance under law? You know, this is nonsense what's going on. Yet Ethiopia still inspires hope. A hope embodied for Brian Stewart in the story of Burhan, the little girl he helped save. Stewart has stayed in touch with Burhan and her father. Today she's not only alive, she's thriving. <laughs> I barely survived death, but came through. And today when I see so many beautiful things, I'm so grateful to be alive. Always I say to myself, I could have been just dust by now, but I'm not. I'm alive to see beauty around me, to learn new things. 
so I'm very happy. What's striking about Burhan is their desire to help. Uh, she wants to help others. And I think there's that element in her of insisting that she has a role to play in Ethiopia, that some forces put her in this position to be of help to Ethiopia. This is where we come from, quite literally, this is it. We all come out of there. We all left there 100,000 years ago, or whatever it was, to go off and be us. Live Aid was the first time, possibly, that we all started speaking to each other again since we all left that place. Africa, the mind, 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 the mind,